on World News tonight. Erdogan stays. Recep Tayyip Erdogan stays in power after the Balkan nation goes into a runoff election to decide the head of state. New House. Indian Prime Minister Modi unveils the new House of Government for the Federal Republic of India after much waiting. Massive attack. Russia bombards Ukraine with the largest drone attack to date, despite fair resistance from the Ukrainian front. Carnival the culture. Sun, sound and colour explode in Berlin for the Festival of Culture, back after three years of silence. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening to you all this Monday night and this is World News. Dini tonight is the historic election runoff in Turkey. Turkey's election board confirmed that Recep Tayyip Erdogan has won Turkey's 2023 presidential election, extending his rule into its third decade in power after facing the tightest race of his career. Tayyip Erdogan is staying on as president of Turkey after winning the runoff presidential election on Sunday with just over 52% of the vote. It was seen as the toughest political challenge yet to his increasingly authoritarian rule, now set to enter its third decade. Speaking to supporters outside his home in Istanbul before the final results were released, he said Turkey is the only winner today. Thousands of jubilant Erdogan supporters celebrated in Turkey's streets. We are very happy. We think Erdogan deserved to win. That was what had to happen. There couldn't have been another leader in this country. Russian President Vladimir Putin congratulated his, quote, dear friend on his victory. The election was seen as one of the most consequential yet for Turkey. The opposition believed it had a strong chance of unseating Erdogan after his popularity was hit by a cost-of-living crisis. Challenger Kamal Kılıçdaroğlu called it the most unfair election in years, but did not dispute the outcome. Erdogan, who is the head of the Islamist-rooted AK party, appealed to voters with nationalist and conservative rhetoric. His record includes having redrawn domestic, economic, security and foreign policy in the NATO member country of 85 million people. The prospect of five more years of his rule is a major blow to opponents who accuse him of undermining democracy as he has amassed even more power, a charge he denies. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi inaugurated India's new parliament building in New Delhi on Sunday, part of a controversial $2.4 billion revamp of the capital's historic center that his critics have called a vanity project. In a ceremony steeped in Hindu religious symbolism, Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi installed the Sengal, a symbolic scepter, in the legislature's lower house. The gold-plated object was gifted to the country's first Prime Minister on the eve of the India's independence from Great Britain in 1947. In keeping with his position as a leader who is intent on shedding India's colonial past, the Prime Minister gave an impassioned speech with inside the building, calling it a temple of the country's democracy and an ideal representation of both the modern and ancient. The building opening has become a flashpoint in the ongoing political and cultural war between Modi and his opponents, who accuse the populist leader of being authoritarian and undemocratic. In the run-up to the event, they had taken issue with Modi's decision to inaugurate the parliament building himself, rather than letting India's president and head of state, Draupati Murmu, lead the ceremony. In a statement last week, 19 political parties announced that they would boycott the opening, saying that the parliament cannot function without the president and calling Modi's prominent role in the ceremony a direct assault on India's democracy. Some politicians question the government's choice of inauguration date, which falls on what would have been the birthday of the late Vinayak Damodar Savakar, a leading figure in India's Hindu's nationalist movement. The ruling Bharatiya Janata Party considers him a hero, while its opponents argue that Savakar's ideology is discriminated against minorities. Indian Home Affairs Minister Amit Shah had dismissed concerns last week, saying that the event should not be politicized and that all lawmakers are invited to attend. Over to the war in Ukraine, several explosions have rocked the Ukrainian capital Kyiv in the 15th Russian air attack on the city this month and the second overnight attack in a row. Ukrainian air defenses were able to destroy 67 out of 75 air targets. 
Russia unleashed waves of airstrikes on the Ukrainian capital overnight as it prepared to celebrate the anniversary of its founding, Kyiv Day, on Sunday. Officials called it a record drone attack on the city, the largest since the war started. Ukraine's air force said it downed 52 out of the 54 Iranian-made kamikaze drones. Falling debris killed a 41-year-old man, Kyiv Mayor Vitaly Klitschko said, and set a three-story warehouse on fire. Witnesses said air raid alerts started soon after midnight, and some people stood on their balconies screaming insults at Russian President Vladimir Putin. With the Ukrainian counteroffensive looming 15 months into the war, Moscow has intensified airstrikes after a lull of nearly two months, chiefly targeting military sites and supplies. Kyiv Day marks the official founding of the city 1,541 years ago. Usually it holds street fairs, live concerts and special exhibitions, but this year's celebrations were planned on a smaller scale. There was a bipartisan breakthrough in plan to avert a debt ceiling disaster. Republican U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy dismissed vehement opposition among party hardliners to a new agreement with President Joe Biden to suspend the $31.4 trillion debt ceiling, predicting that most House Republicans would support the deal. After tough negotiations to reach a tentative debt ceiling deal with the White House, the next challenge for U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is pushing it through his chamber. On Sunday, McCarthy dismissed vehement opposition among party hardliners, predicting that most House Republicans would support the deal to suspend the $31.4 trillion debt ceiling. This is a good, strong bill that a majority of Republicans will vote for. But not everyone agrees. Members of the hardline House Freedom Caucus said they would try to prevent the agreement from passing the House in a vote expected on Wednesday. Republican lawmaker Chip Roy wrote on Twitter Sunday that the agreement would leave intact an expansion of the IRS set in place when Democrats controlled both chambers of Congress. Republican Ken Buck tweeted, I am appalled by the debt ceiling surrender. And Senator Lindsey Graham tweeted, Do not intend to default on debt, but will not support a deal that reduces the size of the Navy and prevents continued technological and weapons assistance to Ukraine. A failure by Congress to deal with its self-imposed debt ceiling before June 5th could trigger a default, according to the Treasury Department. That would shake financial markets and send the United States into a deep recession. Narrow margins in both chambers of Congress mean that moderates from both sides will have to support the bill. Republican opposition could also spell trouble for McCarthy. To win the Speaker's gavel, McCarthy agreed to enable any single House member to call for a vote to unseat him, potentially making him vulnerable to ouster by disgruntled Republicans. But on Sunday, the Speaker said he was not at all concerned about that possibility. U.S. consumer spending increased more than expected in April, boosting the economy's growth prospects for the second quarter and inflation picked up, which could prompt the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates again next month. American consumers spent more than expected in April, boosting the economy's growth prospects for the second quarter. Commerce Department data released Friday showed an increase in consumer spending of 0.8 percent last month. That's twice as much as what economists had expected. The increase comes even as prices continued to rise in April. The Personal Consumption Expenditures Price Index, the Federal Reserve's preferred gauge of inflation, rose 0.4 percent in April after gaining 0.1 percent in March. That puts the annual inflation rate at 4.4 percent for April. It had been at 4.2 percent the month prior. The uptick could prompt the Fed to raise interest rates again next month. Credit has become more expensive since the Fed embarked on its fastest monetary policy tightening campaign since the 1980s to tame inflation. Banks have also tightened lending following recent financial market turmoil. But recent data showing a rebound in factory production and a pickup in business activity suggests the economy is picking up speed after a slow start to the year. And we'll be back with more world news after this short commercial break. Welcome back. 
Canada's Halifax region municipality has declared a local state of emergency in the communities affected by a massive wildfire that has caused thousands of evacuations, school closures and power outages just outside Halifax. The municipality said declaring a state of emergency under the Emergency Management Act gives the municipality a higher level of intergovernmental coordination, access to emergency discretionary funds, the ability to mobilize additional supports, organizations and businesses to support evacuated residents. Nova Scotia RCPM have ordered residents of several subdivisions in the Hammonds Plains area to leave their homes in the face of a fast-moving wildfire. The Westwood Hills subdivision in Upper Tantalon NS was the first to begin an evacuation as the fire consumed at least 10 homes. Halifax Region Fire and Emergency District Chief Rob Hebb said dozens of crews were at the site attempting to control the fire. One helicopter was at the scene and another was on the way. Deputy Chief Dave Meldrum said in an update that there have been no injuries reported from the fire and described it as not under control. He said firefighters will have a better understanding of the size of the fire. Meldrum said people should be prepared to be away from their homes potentially for an extended period of time. Meldrum said residences need to be vigilant about being fire safe by not doing any outdoor burning and carefully disposing of cigarettes. Domestic bush burning and campfires were banned in most of the province. South Korea is striving to become the world's largest arms dealer with its speedy turnover and delivery. An arms deal with Poland is stepping stone to tapping into the European market. South Korea is racing to become a major player in the world's market for weapons eager to tap into Europe's hunger for arms. At this factory on its southern coast, automated robots and workers are churning out artillery vehicles destined for Poland. It's all run by Hanwha Aerospace, already the globe's top maker of howitzers. The company is a big part of the $14 billion arms deal that the South Korean government struck with Poland last year, as Western countries scrambled to arm Ukraine and tensions spike in areas from North Korea to the South China Sea. Book to more than a dozen executives and officials who say the deal will pave the way for Seoul's ambitions to be a world-class weapons supplier. Hanwha Aerospace Director O K Wan. The Czech Republic, Romania, Slovakia, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and others were thinking of buying defense products only in Europe. But now it is more well known that you can buy at a low price and have it delivered quickly from South Korean companies too. The deal was the country's biggest ever of its kind and it promised hundreds of domestically designed rocket launchers, howitzers, tanks and fighter jets. All of which are designed to be compatible with US and NATO systems. Polish officials say South Korea's offer to make weapons faster than almost anyone was a key consideration. Constant tensions with North Korea mean the South's arms production is always up and running and continuously being upgraded. Oskar Petrovich, an analyst in Poland, contrasts that with Germany and other major arms supplier. Countries' interest in South Korea's offer may only grow considering the limited production capacity of German's defense industry, which is major arms supplier in the region. And uh, for example, uh, in 2018, Hungary has ordered 44 Leopards from uh, Leopard tanks uh, from Germany, and so far none has been delivered. South Korean officials told they have pitched Warsaw in producing their weapons within Poland for easier delivery. However, Poland's Ministry of National Defense did not respond to a written request for comment. Last month, South Korea's President Yoon suk yeol told that his country may extend support to Ukraine beyond humanitarian and economic aid if it comes under wide-scale civilian attack. Since then, his government has approved use of at least some South Korean weapons components in Ukraine. South Korean President Yoon suk yeol begins the country's first summit with leaders of Pacific Islands on Monday as Seoul seeks to increase its influence in a region that has become the focus of intense geopolitical rivalry. 
South Korea is taking a step further as a global pivotal state, with President Yoon Song Yeol hosting members of the Pacific Islands Forum in Seoul for the president's first ever multilateral summit as a host. The two-day in-person event, which kicks off Monday afternoon, welcomes 10 leaders of Pacific Island states. Those in attendance will focus on South Korea and the Pacific Islands expanding cooperation under the slogan Navigating Towards Co-Prosperity, Strengthening Cooperation with the Blue Pacific. The forum will have two sessions, one chaired by President Yoon on cooperation and the second by Cook Islands Prime Minister Mark Brown, the current chair of the Pacific Islands Forum. One aspect that South Korean government will focus on is convincing the visitors to support Busan in the city's quest to host the World Expo in 2030. South Korea could potentially win 11 votes from Pacific Islands forum members, and in order to bolster support, President Yoon will head to Busan on Tuesday with the visiting members to tour potential expo sites. Another important aspect to this multilateral summit is that South Korea announced its Indo-Pacific strategy late last year, which centered around freedom, peace and prosperity. But top of agenda at the forum is tackling climate change, with the Pacific Island region feeling the direct consequences of climate change through rising sea levels and have recent devastating hurricanes. President Yoon will be looking at what role South Korea can play to solve the issue while also discussing more sustainable energy options for the countries. South Korea now joins the likes of the US, Japan, France, China and India in hosting PIF members and the top office says this follows their pledge to become a global pivotal state. In the meantime, First Lady Kim gun will also be hosting events for the spouses of the forum members and activities are expected to include showcasing Korean traditional culture. China's homegrown C919 jet completed its first commercial flight from Shanghai to Beijing under China Eastern Airplanes. The Commercial Aviation Corporation of China produced aircrafts is meant to rival Airbus and Boeing as China seeks to become more self-reliant. China's homegrown passenger plane completed its first commercial flight on Sunday, marking a milestone in the country's effort to become more self-reliant. The narrow-body jet is 15 years in the making. The product of state-backed company COMAX aimed to compete with Airbus and Boeing. President Xi Jinping hailed the project as a triumph of Chinese innovation. Some of the plane's first passengers were equally enthused. I'm feeling very emotional. Actually, when I heard about the C919's maiden flight, I spent the whole week paying attention to everything about this development. I was paying attention to when tickets go on sale, then I tried to buy tickets from the moment they were released. The plane completed a two-hour flight from Shanghai to Beijing with China Eastern Airlines, with a return scheduled later in the day Sunday and longer flights on the horizon. A COMAC official recently said the company has won over 1,200 plane orders from at least 32 customers so far, the majority of which are reportedly based in China. Chinese media reported the plane maker expects annual production to reach 150 jets within five years. Although assembled in China, the plane relies heavily on components such as engines and avionics from Western firms. Neither European nor U.S. regulators have certified the aircraft yet. Until they do, key international markets will remain closed to the C919. Given the popularity of COMAC's previous planes with Indonesian airlines, experts estimate the C919's international future lies mainly in the developing world. Welcome back. For more news, let's take care on the world in a minute. Double world champion Max Verstappen led a soggy and slippery Monaco Grand Prix from start to finish to stretch his Formula 1 lead to 39 points and earn Red Bull a sixth win in as many races this season. He was followed by Fernando Alonso of Aston Martin in second, Esteban Ocon of Alpine in third and two Mercedes of Lewis Hamilton and George Russell in fourth and fifth. Thousands of people turned out in Nepal to celebrate 70 years since Mount Everest was first scaled in 1953 with an official rally and march in the capital Kathmandu. Pope Francis proceeded over mass marking Pentecost following a bout of fever that forced him to skip audiences. The Pope had cancelled audiences on Friday after appearing to be fatigued at a meeting with students near the Vatican in the afternoon before. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro arrived in Brasilia to attend a meeting of the Union of South American Nations. The regional summit has been organized by Brazilian President Luiz Inancio Lula da Silva in a bid to revive the UNICEF bloc. 
set up at Decatur to counter U.S. sway in the region. American Joseph Newgarden of Team Pinsk edged out Marcus Erickson to win the Indianapolis 500 in a nail-biting finish to the greatest spectacle in racing as he denied the Swede back-to-back -back wins at the Brickyard. That is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash otherderna English. We leave you tonight with Berlin basking in warm sunshine and festival vibes as the city trumped to the sounds of the Carnival of Cultures, which has returned after the three-year corona haircuts. Good night and see you tomorrow. <laughs>